Sean is from Quantum Spatial. He's a graduate of the University of Kentucky with a BA in Geography and is currently employed as a technical expert at Quantum Spatial, where he oversees large-scale production of ortho imagery. A few things we are going to be asking that you keep your microphones on mute. I do have the ability to mute you or kick you out. Uh, hopefully none of you make us have to do that. This is an hour long session. If you have any questions, we ask that you put them in chat. You can either send it uh, to me as the moderator, or you can simply just do the chat to everyone. And then I will be sending those to Sean at the end of the session. Uh, before we get started, um, if you have any questions, just send it to me quickly, uh, or you could raise your hand. And barring no questions, I think we're ready to get started. So please welcome Sean Conway. Good morning. Um, as Chrissy said, I'm Sean Conway with Quantum Spatial. Um, I am currently a technical expert with them overseeing ortho imagery production. Um, but today I'm going to be presenting on bringing your maps into full 3D. Um, I was planning on, if this were in person, uh, like normal, I was planning on just uh, being on stage with, with my laptop and some slides. But since we have the benefit of me streaming directly from my desktop, I'm gonna be basically doing a full how-to uh, demo. So we'll be showing you how to take it, you know, step by step in the actual software instead of just pictures on the slide. So let me go ahead and start sharing my screen. Okay, so today I'll be using Kentucky from above data. And as you can see, I've got uh, the Cumberland Quadrangle map up on my screen right now. This map was not geo-referenced straight out of, you know, downloading it from the Kentucky from above website. So the first step in doing this is geo-referencing the map. And the quickest, easiest way would be to use the latitude and longitude graticules and just use that as your control point to get it exactly where you need it. And I'm sorry, I should have mentioned that uh, for the GIS side of things, I will try to go through it as quickly as possible. We're all familiar with the tools, so I'm not going to linger on that too much unless there are any questions. Um, I'll try to spend most of the time on Blender since that's what most people will be unfamiliar with. So once you have your map geo-referenced as accurately as possible, I, Right now, I've just got the four extremities uh, control points on there. You can drop as many control points as you feel you, is, is needed to get your map aligned as much as you need to. But once you have that done, let me save that geo-reference. I'll close my geo-reference and then we will, sorry, my external drive is spinning up, so there we go. We'll define the AOI. And you can see I just drew this polygon to define the AOI and I'll use that as a clipping extent for the raster. The rasters are also from the um, Kentucky From Above website. I'm using five foot surface stems. They offer uh, classified LIDAR also if you want to uh, interpolate your own uh, surface from that at whatever, whatever resolution you see fit. But I'm just using their five foot DEMS. Um, I've already downloaded them. And once you have the raster in there, you would just clip it to your extent. And as you can see here, I've got that in there. Now, the thing with this, you can see that the minimum elevation of that is 1,076. I actually want the minimum elevation to be at zero. That way, when you bring it into Blender, into 3D software, the lowest point on the map will be flush with the, uh, with the, the lowest point of your, of your actual 3D map. So I know that there's a river up here that is where the lowest elevation is. And now when I subtract this using raster calculator, I'll subtract the minimum from the raster and that will drop all elevation by that much. And that way this, uh, the river up here will now be flush with the margins of the map. So I have that in here. It looks exactly the same, of course, because uh, when you put this stretch on, it's still gonna look exactly the same but I just run it through raster calculator and it's just raster subtract raster dot minimum. And that's the easiest formula just to get your raster to a zero point. 
Now, that is really all that's required in um, GIS software to get you started in Blender. So let's jump into uh, what most people I'm sure are here to see is how to take it into Blender. I've been working on a story map um, to also have this tutorial in text and uh, I get it, go into a little bit more on there uh, when I eventually publish that. Uh, this is the draft for right now. But one of the things I try to get into is why you would want to take your map into full 3D. Um, ArcGIS offers 3D, Quantum or QGIS offers 3D also. Um, so why would you want to take it from, you know, software that already offers 3D and Hillshade models, things to that effect. The, the great thing about Blender is it does offer full ray traced uh, illumination. You have an actual light source that is casting light. Your shadows are real. Um, they actually cast on other objects within the scene uh, and into the margins, which is not something you can do currently that I'm aware of with uh, ArcGIS. Uh, Q, QGIS does offer a new add-on called Ray Shader, which does something similar. So if you're familiar with Ray Shader, you can, you can make maps uh, similar to that in QGIS. But let's go ahead and start bringing this into Blender. Now this is not how your Blender will look like the first time you bring it up. Um, I have this saved to the state that I like it to look when I, when I bring up Blender to work into it. But I'm going to set this back to factory defaults just so you can get an idea of what it will look like the first time you load it up. There we go. And you can see you have a camera, a cube, and a light source up here. This is the default cube, and this is the default camera. I can go into the camera and look at the cube. Hit F12 to make sure everything's working. It rendered that cube just fine. So the very first thing you would do is delete those. You don't, you don't need those. Uh, you also don't really need this uh, animation timeline down here at the bottom. You can just move that out of the way. Now Blender does have what's, what are called nodes to make things, uh, to add a lot of complexity to your scene. Today, I'm gonna tr just try to show you the quickest, easiest way to bring your maps into full 3D. I will not be working with nodes. I'm gonna avoid those. Um, I hope to make an advanced tutorial where I do work more with nodes and to show you a little bit more in the advanced side, such as um, high dynamic range imagery to use as a light source, uh, volumetric uh, fog and clouds, things to that effect that you can add to your scenes to, to just you know bring a little bit more to it. But for right now, I, I really wanna just focus on taking your map as quickly and easily into 3D as I can. And to that end, while I do recommend going through other tutorials such as um, Daniel Huffman's tutorial called Creating Shaded Relief for Blender, he shows you how to take everything into Blender as Blender is stock. And it's a wonderful tutorial, shows you so much about how Blender works and gets you familiar with some of the, the ideas that I may be talking about. Um, but what I really want to do is uh, hit the easy button on this again. On this again, it's um, this is to get you going as quickly as possible. So what I would recommend is downloading an add-on called Blender GIS. It's on GitHub, free to download and free to use. And um, again, it's called Blender GIS. You would just download the zip. I already have it installed on here, so all I need to do is turn it on. But to install it, you would just uh, go to your preferences, add-ons, and install, and point that to the zip file. Excuse me. <clears throat> point that to the zip file, and um, just install it as is. You don't have to unzip it. Once you have it installed, you would just need to activate it. All right. And this, again, is going to be the quickest way for you to bring your map into full 3D. Um, now, the purpose of georeferencing the map was to generate a, a world file. Blender GIS does recognize uh, coordinate systems, projected coordinate systems. It has geographic ones in there, but they do not work well. I, you need to use a projected coordinate system. And, um, <clears throat> excuse me. 
once you have your map geo reference and you have a, a world file with it, you can go into GIS, import, geo reference raster. And the first thing I'm going to do is bring my map in. Um, as you can see, it gives me a list of recent uh, folders I've been to. So I'm just going to use that to navigate to them. I'll be going to that Cumberland uh, raster. Let's see here. And I'll be telling it that the coordinate system, it is a Kentucky one zone. So that's uh, just 6473 EPSG. You can search by EPSG codes. And do apologize, I did that incorrectly. Uh, I forgot to change my coordinate system. I put that in, so it just loaded in as WGS84. Um, to make sure that everything aligns properly, I'm going to close this out and start back over on that to make sure I get the proper coordinate system. And again, when you first open Blender, you'll have the default cube. You can just delete that, the camera, and the light source. So again, GIS, import raster. I want to make sure my mode is base map on new plane, and that will just load in your map as a just a, a plane object. Uh, an actual plane and Kentucky single zone is my coordinate system. Okay, and now we can see that loaded in just fine. And I apologize, let me bring, I need to bring my uh, story map back up here. I'm kind of using that as a, as a prompt for myself to make sure I, I'm hitting all the, uh, hitting all the notes here. Okay, and um, the next thing we'll want to do is to actually displace the map. So we'll go again into import raster and using Blender GIS. Uh, I don't personally use Blender GIS anymore. I've written some custom Python scripts and that's the great thing about Blender is if you're familiar with working with Python from ArcGIS or from QGIS, um, you'll have some Python experience and you can start bringing working with Blender, um, Python and Blender to, to, to accomplish a lot of the tasks that you want to. But I'll, be, I'll go into my surface data here. I've got the five foot dem uh, zeroed out. I'll want to change my mode to dem as displacement texture. Apply that to my existing mesh. If you have more than one mesh in, you'll just need to make sure you have the correct one chosen here. And now what this box here is, is a subdivision modifier. It's um, basically, it subdivides your, the plane uh, to polygons that can be displaced by the raster that I'm bringing in. Uh, that is what you wanna choose. If you've already subdivided your plane uh, on your own, you can choose none, but we have not done that, so. And I'm gonna turn off the smooth relief. Um, sometimes you get gridding in your surface data. You'll notice when you displace it that it looks like there's a grid pattern. A smooth relief will actually help get rid of that gridding pattern. But right now we're gonna import that. All right, now you can see I now have relief on this map. It looks very, uh, not very detailed. And what we're going to do is um, go to the modifier properties. And you can see right here in this top one, this is the subdivision modifier. It's showing that my viewport, which is this window showing me right here, is set to six. It can go up to 11, and that's actually what I'm going to send my render to because I would want, want it to render at the highest quality I can. However, to keep my computer running cool and quickly, I'm going to keep my viewport at nine. And you can see the quality's gotten a little bit better. If we want to, we can go ahead and set that to 11 for right now, just to take a look at what the final product would look like. And it does just take a moment to do that. And we've got, that's the full detail in 3D now. And that's that, uh, one-time exaggeration, so it's at one-to-one -one scale. 
and drop this back to nine. And I'm, I apologize, I'm using some shortcuts that uh, I'll try to remember to say as I use them. So seven on your number pad will take you to an overhead orthographic view. Um, so everything is corrected so that it, you're looking straight down at every point. There's no lean towards the outer edges. Uh, it is all straight down. And from here, you might want to adjust the scale. Say you want to make it look a little more exaggerated. We can go to two times and now see we've got a little more exaggeration on that. This does have its own built-in hillshade and like standard hillshade is coming from the Northwest. Um, if we do go to render this, however, we can see nothing's going on. Let me actually turn this off. I, I apologize, I had a node turned on that's expecting a texture and that's why everything was that pink color. The texture's miss, missing, there's no texture there so it made everything pink. But we can see that there's really not much going on here. Um, we have no light source. So that's the next step is adding light so that we will actually be casting some shadows. And what I'm going to use is a uh, sun light source and that's shift A to add, then light, sun. And the sun is currently directly over my map and shining directly down on it. So it's, uh, you don't, you're still not really getting any shadows. Um, Blender treats a, a, the sun lamp as a light source uh, infinitely far away, casting parallel light directly on your object. So I'm going to hit one to go to a front orthographic view. And that shows me the sun. I'm going to, it doesn't matter where you put it since it treats it as um, parallel rays infinitely far away. It doesn't matter where you actually put the sun in your scene but I do like to move it to about where I would have an actual light source if it were say a lamp and seven again to go to a top orthographic view. So I'm gonna put it in the Northwest here. And now I'm gonna make it so that it will actually shine in the direction that I want it to. Again, one to go to front orthographic view, R to rotate the sun and I'm gonna rotate it up and you can actually see my my model is now changing along with the sun. Seven to go back to a top orthographic view. And say we want it about there. Still does not look great. Uh, you can see that the, the light is very dim. Shadows are quite harsh. Uh, some people, you know, you might want to soften your shadows around the edges a little bit, but some people do like it to show exactly, you know, like, like a sun really would. So we'll go to the uh, object data properties for the light here. We're going to increase the strength on this this particular one. Um, let's try 3.5. That's actually going to not be quite as bright as we increase the sun angle. The sun angle is basically the, the size of the sun in your sky. The, the larger your light source, the larger the angle, um, the softer your shadows will be. So we'll increase that. And you can see my shadows are getting softer around the edges. Um, the scene's also getting a little bit softer where there were harsh shadows on the hillside are now uh, a little little lighter. You can make it a little more detail. All right. And the next thing we're gonna to wanna to do, once you get the sun set up like you want to, you can of course change the color. Let's say you wanted a little bit of a evening setting sun orange or morning pinkness to it. Um, you can change the color to whatever you, you may want for your scene. <clears throat> Excuse me. And again, uh, just, I might make it a little bit stronger here. I don't want to blow out the details too much. But once you have that where it is, the next thing you want to think about are is the material itself. Um, the map itself is actually just a, a little bit shiny it's, uh, and what we're gonna do is select it over here and go to the material properties. And you can see there's a lot of options here, but we're only gonna worry about two of them for now, the specular and the roughness. Specular is the, uh, basically the reflex, reflectivity of the, the material itself. We're gonna just set that to zero and we're gonna set the roughness to one. 
that'll make it appear a little less shiny, a little less plasticky. Um, hopefully more like the, the paper itself. And we're basically at this point ready to go. Um, we've got everything set up for very basic render. I'll go to my uh, properties over here. Now my render engine is already set to cycles. Um, I do prefer cycles for this. However, there is another render, render engine called Eevee. And Eevee uh, works more like video game render engines where it doesn't cast um, real shadows and light. It approximates it. You can see the shadows look quite different in Eevee now. Um, it, the advantage of Eevee is both in rendering as you're working on it and when you go to your actual render, is extremely fast. Um, again, kind of like how video games can render 60 frames a second. Um, this EV looks a lot easier to work with. Um, it renders very quickly, um, but again, it only approximates the sun and the shadows. So I'm gonna go back to cycles. And it's a little slower to work with. It uh, takes a moment to render back out, but you still have an idea of what it looks like. Now, the next step in rendering after we've got the material and our lights set up is to uh, activate a camera. This will not render without a camera. F12 is your shortcut to render a frame. And you can see I'm getting an error that no camera is found. So again, we're using Blender GIS to make this as easy as possible. And we want an orthographic camera so that it'll render just like we're looking at it here so there's no lean towards the edges. If it was um, not orthographic, uh, it would be, look a little more like this where you can see the uh, mountainous areas towards the edges are leaning way out over the margins. You can use a, a perspective camera if you want, if, if you're going for that sort of effect. But for this, I want to use an ortho camera. And we're just going to go to geo render. We just make sure the object that you want the camera to focus on is the one you have selected over here in your table of contents. And GIS, geo render. And it just takes a moment. You can see my camera is now outlined on here. To go to your camera view to make sure everything looks good, the shortcut is zero on your 10 key numpad. And this is exactly how the camera is looking at it. Um, I do suggest having your scale set before setting your camera. If say I were to increase my scale to five, you can see now this whole ridge line is clipping through the camera and um, you'll have to basically delete your camera and remake it in order to get the scene in there now. Um, let me see if I can get my camera in the view here. You can see where the camera is, is now below the exaggerated elevation. Let's change this back to two. All right, so we've got our camera set up and the camera will most of the time generally read the uh, properties of, the, uh, of your object of the actual image that you brought in. And we'll go to output properties here and you can see it's already filled in my resolution. Um, so it won't always do that. Uh, I've noticed it, sometimes it will default to the maximum resolution that Blender will go to and you'll just have to manually set it. But this one, it automatically read it, so that's good. Um, the first thing you wanna do is a test render. I'm gonna do 20% here. And we don't need to worry about anything else below here. Um, the frame setup is, uh, that's, this is for animation and we're not animating right anything right now. Uh, we're gonna go back to render properties. Again, make sure you're in cycles. Um, this is set to GPU compute. Uh, Blender does can use a GPU, it renders much quicker, but it can also use CPU. And that's something I need to set up actually. So I'll go to preferences my system, I've got my uh, CUDA is for your GPU. I've got my GPU selected and I already had my CPU selected also, so that's good. Um, I just wanna make sure those are both selected. 
I do sometimes run into uh, problems with my renderings uh, because the graphics card that I have is factory overclocked and Blender does not like overclocked graphics cards. So I will occasionally run into errors and for some reason it, it helps if I turn off my CPU rendering, which slows down my render times, but not by a whole lot. Um, so if you do have a factory overclock card, there's not much you can do. I've tried um, underclocking my card to make up for it to back to, you know, um, factory base, but that does not help, I guess, because it is factory overclocked. But if you are overclocking your card on your own, then you'll want to turn that off before you use Blender. All right. Now we've got it set to cycles, GPU compute. We are using path tracing. Now right here, the render samples are set to 512. 512 is my is the base that I use. Um, once we render this out, I'll, I'll explain a little more about what that does. But what you'll see it at when you first load this up is 128. And that's what I'm going to render at just to just to show what that looks like and why we want to increase that. Um, the total number of light bounces are through here. This is uh, what I found works best for me. Um, total number is 25 and then within that the diffuse bounce is at 10 and everything else five. I'm not using any volume metrics in this uh, in this render so I just set that to one or you can even go to zero. And once we're ready, we have that at 20%. There's one more setting I need to turn off that's not generally set by default. That's denoising data, and I'll show you a little bit more on that a little bit later. So we have this all set up. We're ready to render. So it's F12 to bring up your render window. It'll, in the upper left-hand corner here, it'll show the current progress. It'll take you just a moment to load in all the data. And these are the um, the tiles that's rendering out. Each of those that uh, in, I guess, Blender parlance is referred to as a bucket. Um, it's got one bucket per thread of my CPUs, and the one that's going very quickly and rendering everything is my GPU. One thing I should have done before rendering this, I'm actually going to cancel this render, is I should have turned down my tile size since I'm using my CPU also. If we go further down the uh, render properties here, you can see there's tile size here and set to 240. And that's a little high to be using with my CPU also. It's fine with just my GPU. Um, I do have an add-on called auto tile size. I'm gonna turn that add-on off. It just calculates the best size for your tiles. Um, but if I'm using CPU, I'm actually gonna set this to 64 on both of those. And we're going to start that render back over. The GPU can render rather quickly, but the CPUs are a little bit slower, so I set the bucket size smaller so that they can work a little bit quicker on that. Um, the great thing about the CPU is that as the GPU is rendering, once the GPU is done rendering a tile, they can go back and do pre-filtering for denoising. And again, denoising is something I'll get into once I show you this render here. And this is at that, um, full subdivision modifier for the surface. So we've got as much detail as we can get here. The more complex an area may be, the slower it'll go. And of course, this is at 20% rendering uh, it, it will in, in the hillier areas i'm sorry i'm gesturing at my screen here trying to to point to you you know where where i'm talking about but um in in the hillier areas where there's more elevation change it will slow down especially at a 100 percent render um, your gpu will uh, sit there and spin on it for a while you can see these samples um, sampling out as it goes and one thing that i want to show you is i apologize i'm 
believe I still have denoising on. Um, over here in the shadows, normally we'll get a lot of noise, little white speckles through there. Uh, with Blender, they call those fireflies and denoising helps you get rid of those. And I was trying, I wanted to show you, it's, it's basically like what you see here with a low sample count. This is only 32 samples. You can see I have a lot of speckles going on, especially in the shadows here, a lot of fireflies. And what I turned off earlier was the denoising data. I must still have that on somewhere. Um, and that will help you get rid of that. Or the alternative, is turning up your sample size. Again, 128 is the base sample size in uh, Blender once you first open it up. I'm going to set it to back to 512 where I normally sample it at. And increasing the sample size will help reduce the fireflies, but then denoising will take it a step further. There are two ways to denoise, and I said I was gonna stay away from nodes in Blender. Um, However, there is a new type of denoiser in Blender called an AI denoiser, and it does so much of a better job at denoising the data that uh, I'm really gonna step through that here and show you some node usage with that um, because you have to use a special part of Blender called the compositor. And it basically, once your render is done, it composites uh, denoised information in with your render and will help get rid of these fireflies. Um, the base denoiser in Blender is, let's see here, I apologize, I haven't used the regular denoiser in some time now. Um, Okay, I'm sorry, there is a, a built-in denoiser in Blender, but it basically just uh, blurs the imagery to get rid of the fireflies. It has a certain distance from the pixel that it'll look to and just kind of blur the imagery together. The AI denoiser, however, um, we would click denoising data here. And this is when you would start using your node setup. Um, right now, this node setup that I have is for HDRIs. It's uh, another way of lighting that uh, I'm not sure if I'll have time to get into now. I, I can really want to avoid nodes if at all possible, but the AI denoiser is just such an important thing to use that I'd like to show that. And we would change our editor type to compositor. And this is the basic setup. Um, you would have your render layers and composite will be the first thing you see normally. Um, you won't have this denoise. And to add that, we would just go to add, search, noise and drop that into there put our image there image into image denoising normal into normal and denoising albedo into albedo and that is um, what happened when I rendered the first time it automatically denoised it to get rid of all these speckles that were in there again upping your sample count is another way to um, get rid of any fireflies that you see in your shadows if you're noticing an excessive amount um, drop that down all right and now that we have a basic setup again trying to get you into bringing your map into 3D as quickly and easily as possible. And again, this, this Blender GIS add-on is wonderful for that. It does everything for you. Um, while I can use that for a lot of my workflow, I, I did write my own Python code just mainly to learn Blender a little bit better. Um, I did read the Python code for Blender GIS. You can go through and read that and that'll help you understand exactly what it's doing if you want a, a, a deeper insight on that or you can just use Blender GIS and uh, as is, and you're ready to go with a lot more that it can do. Now, a few other things you can do is if you feel, you know, your shadows are maybe a little bit too dark. This is basically a full photo studio for you now. It, it's, uh, you can use things like multi-light setups. Um, if you prefer to use spotlights instead of the sun, you can set up several spotlights, three-point lighting like a studio. 
you can set up uh, reflection panes. So say I wanted some of my light to reflect back into those hills so the shadows aren't so dark. Um, I would shift A to add, mesh, plane. And this is at geographic scale. So the plane that it adds is actually extremely tiny. You can't even see it here. So I'm gonna hit S to scale. And I'm gonna scale that way up. You can see it just starting to come into view. And I'm gonna to go to one for front orthographic, rotate that up, R to rotate, seven, and I'm gonna rotate it right about there. And you can already see it working on my model. All right, I've got that scaled up and you can see it, it softens the shadows. Um, now on that, if I wanted to, I could even change the color of that plane and that will reflect a different color than what the sun is. Where I'm gonna, I went to material properties and I'm going, I just added a new material. I can change the base color of that. Say I wanted to reflect just a little bit of purple into the scene. And I can see uh, just in the part that's closest to the reflection plane, I now have purple highlights within my shadows. Um, there's, so much that you can do with Blender. And again, I'm trying to show the simplest way. I, I'm not even getting into the node setup yet. What more Blender GIS can do. Um, but this is basically where we're at right now. I, and I would like to show um, a little bit more of the, the more advanced information. Um, so this is an animation that I made for Kentucky from above, showing what, what you can do once you get into Blender, start digging in. Um, this is, I brought in the contour shape file, the actual vectors using uh, Blender GIS again. It can bring in shape files and turn those into a mesh for you. And then I'm scaling them on a Z axis using keyframes, which if you're familiar with uh, animating in ArcGIS Pro, you, you're familiar with keyframes, I'm sure. So. I'm using keyframes to exaggerate the Z values of those contours to bring them up there. And then again, keyframes to exaggerate the Z scale here. And as it pans across, a uh, volumetric fog will start filling the valleys. And then I actually just lower this mesh, this object through a flat plane. And it takes a long time to render an animation. I think this one took about three days just for this short animation. But it's uh, just another fun thing you can do with Blender to, to really highlight your map. Um, I know we've still got 25 minutes. Uh, I, may have, I may have gone through that a little too quickly, but that gives us time, hopefully, for any questions that I may have glossed over or um, something that you'd like to know more about. I'd be happy to answer any questions there are. Thank you, Sean. This is Christy, the moderator. So if you have questions for Sean, uh, you can either uh, raise your hand and then we'll uh, call on you so that we only have one person going at a time. Or uh, if you don't have a microphone and want to type it into the chat, that would work also. And then for anyone that doesn't know how to raise your hand, uh, if you hover, let me see if I remember how to do it. <laughs> I think it's uh, on the chat bubble at the bottom of your screen if you're on a PC, maybe, that you can do that, the three dots. And I do apologize if I went through that pretty quickly. Uh, I'm, as you can tell, not a, not a natural presenter. I'd rather be sitting in a room with, with a few people, you know, where we can just casually talk about it as we go, but um, this is fun too. Oh, um, Jessica, yeah, uh, I guess some people may know me on Instagram and Twitter as geo underscore spatialist is what I go by. And you can see a lot of my uh, maps I've done using this method on there. Um, if we have time and if anybody's interested, I would like to show people how to use high dynamic range imagery for their lighting instead of a sun source. Uh, it's what I 
almost exclusively use now just because I think it gives them a much more, uh, much better re result, but it, we do have to dive into nodes for that. Lewis Hill has a question. Hi, Sean. Uh, that was a phenomenal presentation. Thank you. Um, what other, so I've seen a ton of your work with DEMs. Have you done any other raster data like, um, like suitability or like, like transit modeling, uh, like route up, like, are, do you have any other samples that you can show us of like just some of the creative ways you can apply this? Hmm. Let's see, right offhand. Um, one thing, so, some raster data I have, I have used is, um, it's pretty far back in my, my Twitter account. I don't want to, uh, sit here and scroll back through it, but it, I used uh, wind data as uh, kind of an elevation source. So the higher the wind speed, the higher the uh, elevation was on my map. So it looked like uh, terrain data, but it was actually wind data and which, you know, wind increases over elevation. So it actually did kind of match terrain data too. Um, one, uh, let me actually suggest somebody else who works with Blender and GIS data is Owen Powell. Uh, this, if you can see it on my screen here, was actually done in Blender. Um, this is Jimi Hendrix concerts, and um, I know that Owen uses uh, FME. He's uh, an FME wizard, really. He will um, process all his data through FME to to, um, to automate everything and to get it where he wants to use it. And this is some more data that you can use Blender for. He, uh, I'm not sure. It, I remember somebody recently saying that they've been experimenting with uh, another add-on called, um, oh, I'm trying to remember what it's called now. It's um, it's, it's an animation uh, node setup. And I believe that, that Owen uses that also. It has a route um, function, and I'm not sure if he's using that for this particular animation, but it does have uh, a route function in the uh, Blender animation nodes add-on. Um, I, I've not really dived into animation nodes myself, uh, but I'd really like to. I, I hope to get into that soon. Um, but let's see if I can find some other. So my self-promotion here, these are, these are all the maps I've done. Um, I, I've been playing with tessellated data, um, just displacing it using elevation also. So it's, um, it's generalized elevation but really any data can be added to those uh, numerically and used as an elevation. And let's see, I do have some with uh, LIDAR data. Sorry, I also Mars elevation is fun to play with too. Um, Blender does not have, uh, Blender GIS does not recognize Martian um, coordinate systems. So you would just have to trick it into bringing that in. I believe I told it was in Web Mercator when I made that. Um, I'm hoping to find some uh, LiDAR data that I used to make a map. Uh, Esri's uh, Instagram account actually asked me, they came to me the day before Manhattan Henge was supposed to happen and asked me if there's something that I can make that would highlight Manhattan Henge as it occurred. Um, and I apologize. I, I know it's no fun watching me scroll back through all this. Um, trying to find just my Manhattan Henge map. I post a little bit too much, I guess. Um, you can see this is some of that LiDAR data also that you can bring into Blender. Uh, Blender does also support uh, OB OBJ models. So if you have building models, uh, you can bring those in as is and Blender GIS can, um, well, Blender GIS can, can read uh, some, like ASCII files and bring in, um, ASCII file as a model and that way it'll align everything for you uh, on your map. I do enjoy um, taking these oblique shots also that's not actually what I was meaning to go to. Um, so just nice shots and maps once you get into it uh, again you can do a lot with the camera set depth of field um, focal length uh, it, it's again a, a, a photography studio uh, in the palm of your, in, in, on your computer. Um, this is again working with LiDAR data and this was um, I took the vegetation data, separated it from the surface, rendered the surface, then added the vegetation to it also with its own material color um, so that you could you know you could just make out the trees on that. 
And this is the Manhattan Henge one. Again, something you can do with LIDAR. Um, so I was trying to highlight the best cross streets to watch Manhattan Henge from, and I couldn't figure out a way to light them up. Uh, Manhattan Henge does uh, basically shine down every cross street. Um, but I was, I only wanted to highlight just the, the ones that are considered the best where there's less obstruction, um, where, the, where it's the widest. So I could set my sun to basically shine in a way that would light all of these cross streets up. But instead I actually dropped an object, a line object down both of these streets and then gave it a transmission value. So it's actually glowing. It's like a light, its own light source. And I had to turn it off, turn off the actual object itself. So all there is is the light, no, uh, no actual object in there to cast shadows of itself or anything. So that, that's just another, you know, one other way, you know, thinking outside the box a little bit that you can use um, Blender is to show, you know, full building footprints um, and, and to use other objects within Blender once you, once you learn a little bit more. And I am absolutely a Blender novice still. I, I use it for a very specific purpose and unfortunately, I, I've not explored it as much as I'd like to outside of what I use it for. And um, so it took me way longer than it should have just to figure out how to make these objects casting the light down these streets not cast its own shadow. So again, I, the reason I've not done a tutorial up till now is because I don't feel like a subject matter, matter expert. And I just, it's not something that, um, you know, I, I felt as an authority on, but nobody else is really uh, jump to the task. I guess I, I've been hoping that somebody else might make a, a nice in-depth tutorial for, for everybody else, but um, but I, I figure I'll, I'll get out there and, and do my best. Well, Sean, I will say as the moderator, I, I, I would disagree with you not being a subject matter expert. I, I learned quite a bit from what you were doing today. Do we have any other questions? Jessica did put a link to your Twitter account. Oh, awesome, thank you. I think, is that specifically to one in particular, but that'll get you there if anyone wants to follow Sean on that. Any other questions? We've got 12 more minutes. Okay. Um. You know, if this was in person, everyone would just be uh, talking nonstop. <laughs> yeah, feel free to unmute yourself and just start talking. Oh, I'm sorry, I don't, that's that's the moderator's job to do. I should not have said that. Ignore what I said. No, no. If, if, <laughs> if you're good with people just unmuting and asking questions, uh, I, it, you know, it doesn't look like they'd be talking over each other. So. Absolutely. Well, if no one else is going to ask anything. So, Sean, how long have you been using Blender? Uh, for a little over a year now, I think. Um, I still basically do things the same way as when I started, but I've learned a lot of tricks and tips here and there to eke out a little bit more detail or to um, make it look a little bit better. Again, like I said, I, I primarily use HDRIs to light a scene now. That's one thing that not a lot of people jump into at first. They are all open source, uh, James. Um, Blender is free and available to use. Uh, Blender.org, you can download it there. And Blender GIS is um, a free add-on um, that you can just Google it and you'll be, uh, you should get to the GitHub, GitHub repository and you can download the zip. Um, let's see, the other add-ons that aren't necessary really are uh, the auto tile sizer that is free. Um, I have paid for one add-on in my life, and there is a Blender marketplace where you can buy add-ons, and it's this one right here. It's the Pro Lighting Studio. It really doesn't work for, for doing maps. It's mainly meant for like an actual studio scene with large objects in the scene. Um, so that was not money well spent, but it's still fun to play with sometimes. Um, but otherwise, everything that I've discussed here, with the exception, obviously, of ArcGIS Pro, is open source software and is free to use. Uh, 
Um, Kenny, uh, the tutorial I mentioned earlier, um, let's see here if I can, I'll put the link in the chat is, uh, things getting in my way up top. How do I make this go away? There we go. It's uh, Daniel Huffman. His blog is called something about map or yeah, something about maps. And he does a, um, he has a post on bringing elevation data into Blender, not using Blender GIS. This is uh, wonderful for going through all the very basics so you, you get a better understanding of how Blender works and, and why things work, such as I, I just quickly mentioned the subdivision modifier. He explains in more detail why you need a subdivision modifier um, when, when you do this. And I believe Owen Powell has actually um, started doing some video tutorials. And I, I, I'm sorry, I don't have it handy, his um, video tutorials, but I believe he's done a few. Again, he works FME in as part of his workflow to automate this and to isolate data that he specifically wants to use. Um, he is, what he does is absolutely phenomenal and I love his work. Um, but I would certainly check him out. Owen J. Powell, I believe it is. I'm sorry, let me see. I, I sent a link for his Blender Nation page. Oh, okay, great. And um, one other person I'd suggest uh, who does not use Blender, and I'm sorry, this, I don't know if I can move this. Ah, oh, there we go, get that out of my way is Craig Taylor. Um, he does some wonderful stuff with GIS data. Um, I would certainly suggest following him for any ideas, something fun to do. Um, he does not use Blender though. He uses uh, another program called Houdini, which is not open source. You do have to pay for a license, but he also does uh, tutorials and um, just looking at the, the things that he, that he does, I, I almost want to invest in a, in a Houdini license. Um, but this is something he's, he did a while ago called Coral Cities um, using Houdini and GIS data. Um, the things he produces are just phenomenal. And I guess getting back to that question earlier, this is a lot more data, you know, other GIS data that you can bring in. And again, with Blender GIS, it can ingest things such as vector data, rasters, uh, polygons, um, and you can use that within your mapping. That, I used several of those um, for that video I showed you. So, uh, you know, there's a lot you can do that that's probably been, you know, this, the surface has barely been scratched. Um, using 3D software like Houdini or Blender as a GIS platform is just, I think there's so much that can be, that can be done by people who are smarter than I and can think further outside the box. And it looks like he's reposted Dom Rickabean here. Um, Dom, I, I, we talk actually on a regular basis. Dom is awesome, very intelligent guy. He doesn't come from the GIS community or GIS spatial community that I know of, but um, he's, you know, we were working on a LIDAR project together at one point and he pointed out things that just did not occur to me that solve problems much easier. And he just picks up on all this so quickly and he does his own three, he does actual 3D uh, milling uh, of some data. So this is Crater Lake that he did. We actually did Crater Lake about the same time my render and, and his, um, his render of it here. And then any of the links that we shared in the chat, uh, sorry, that's the alarm warning we were at five minutes. Uh, you can always click the three dots in the bottom right corner of the chat and say save chat. And that will let you um, save any of these links for after the session. Any other questions? Well, thank you, Sean. Uh, thank you.